Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Ollie. This is the first video that I'm recording as part of my FY3 year, which I will talk to you about and explain another time. Because today we're going to be talking about cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are basically problems that occur while we are trying to think and reason. Each and every day we will all make thousands of decisions while we're trying to process the world around us. And for doctors this obviously includes things like making treatment plans for patients, forming diagnoses and performing surgery. But with limited time and attention, we have vulnerable to these shortcuts that our brains try to take to allow us to make decisions faster while trying to expend less effort. But unfortunately this can lead to serious errors which put patients or indeed ourselves at risk. So I think it's important to try and learn a bit about these cognitive biases where we can and I'm going to talk about five of the most common ones today. So the first of these is anchoring bias, relying too heavily on the first piece of information that we encounter when making our decisions and then not moving sufficiently from that starting point. That is to say that a doctor, for the first time that they see a patient, they might form an impression or jump to a diagnosis, and in making that initial impression, they then fail to sufficiently reevaluate or move away from it. So to give an example, a patient might present with a very kind of vague, mild sounding presentation, and the doctor's first thought is that this is some mild, self-limiting, common condition. Because of the anchoring bias, they then don't go on to, because of the anchoring bias, they've already reached their conclusion, they don't order more investigative tests, and then a more serious diagnosis becomes overlooked. A good example of this might be something like ovarian cancer, which can present with very vague abdominal symptoms, or indeed something that appears to be a harmless flu might actually represent something like a seroconversion process in someone infected with HIV. The second one that we're going to talk about is the overconfidence bias and this stems from overconfidence that people and obviously in this case we're talking about doctors have in their skills knowledge and abilities. People who exhibit this kind of bias tend to believe that they are more highly performing than they actually are which leads them then to overestimate their performance and their accuracy which reduces the probability of their diagnoses or their decisions being correct. And obviously in healthcare when doctors, for example, are making diagnoses, in a similar vein to the previous example, these doctors will feel so certain and have such faith in their diagnostic abilities, which they may have honed and worked on over many, many years of experience, that they then neglect to consider other options or investigate further, which could result in failing to make the correct diagnosis or an inappropriate treatment. A really specific example might be a consultant of many years experience, and they feel that because they're at the top of the hierarchy, because they've got the most skills and experience of anyone around, that their judgment, their sense of instinct must be right. Number three then today is the diagnostic momentum bias. And this is the tendency for a physician to continue with a diagnosis or a treatment plan based on a previous set of findings and decisions, even when new information has appeared that may suggest a better course of action. And we're most vulnerable to this happening when a diagnosis has already been made. That patient is then started on a treatment plan of some kind, and that may be the correct treatment plan for that initially diagnosed condition. But then when the situation changes, perhaps new symptoms start to appear. Those symptoms are put down to the original incorrect diagnosis rather than signifying to the person involved that something different might be going on. For example, let's say you've got a patient who has a diagnosis already of Parkinson's disease and they start to experience cognitive decline. Now, it would be very easy and very tempting for a doctor who's rushed off their feet to put down that cognitive decline to progression of Parkinson's disease, when actually in reality there may be a completely different disease process going on and this patient should be investigated for something different like Alzheimer's dementia. But crucially, you wouldn't know that that was the case unless you chose to do different investigations. Now, let's take a quick break to talk about today's sponsor, Brilliant. If you're watching this channel at all, and especially this video, then you are interested in learning. And Brilliant is a fantastic online platform that allows you to do just that. It's a fun and interactive way to learn about maths, data, and computer science by doing rather than just reading or watching. Solving problems as you go and using your new skills to work through scenarios that test your understanding. As we're discussing today, probabilities are really important in medical decision making, so why not take a look at their data science courses 
and learn more about understanding and illustrating them. It is a great and easy to access solution for busy people like professionals and students. So to try everything that Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Ollie Burton. You can see the link down in the description below. And the first 200 of you that use that link will receive a full 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So thanks as always to Brilliant for being brilliant by sponsoring this video. Fourth bias we're gonna to discuss today is the availability heuristic. And this in simple terms is estimating the likelihood of an event based on how easily instances of it come to your mind or how readily available to you certain pieces of information are. That is to say that you are more likely to diagnose something as a doctor if you recently encountered a similar case or you read about that disease, for example, in a medical journal, even if in reality, that condition is actually quite rare. So for example, let's say that you're working in acute medicine, you're doing the take, and you recently treated a patient with a rare infectious zoonotic disease. That doctor will then go on to perceive a higher prevalence of that condition in the general, in the general population than actually exist. But because it's dwelling on their mind and they're thinking about it, they are more likely to diagnose it in new patients that they see. That is to say that you'll look for it in places where it doesn't really exist. Or to think about it another way, let's say that you are working on a busy respiratory unit during the winter flu season. It's very easy, obviously, to diagnose everyone that comes through the door with flu. If it's the most readily available common cause for coughing and sneezing around you, even when the real answer might be something else. And then the last one we're going to talk about today, number five, is the conjunction rule. This is a specific type of cognitive bias that occurs when people perceive the likelihood of two different events happening together to be more likely than either of those events happening individually. But as we know, according to probability theory, the likelihood of two events co-occurring, that is the conjunction in this case, should always be lower than the probability of either of them happening separately. However, in this particular case, what people are doing is ignoring this and mistakenly perceiving, and mistakenly perceiving that the conjunction is instead more likely. So to give an example here, and this example is taken from a paper all about cognitive biases in healthcare that I'd really recommend going and having a read of. A patient who has three things going on, let's say they are confused, hypoxic, and have poor renal function, that patient is much more likely to have a pneumonia, a single unifying diagnosis, than they are to have a subdural bleed, a pulmonary embolism, and renal obstruction all at the same time. These disparate conditions are much less likely to happen all at the same time than one single unifying diagnosis. Or indeed, a version of the argument surrounding this that you may have heard of before is something called Occam's razor. The simplest solution, or the one that makes the fewest assumptions, is the most likely. And it does apply in healthcare, although, as ever, watch out for zebras. So thanks very much for watching, guys. Please be sure to hit that like button for me, leave a comment, subscribe, and don't forget to go and check out my website, ollieburton.com, to keep abreast of what I'm getting up to, especially in my first non-training year, which is very exciting. Take care. I'm obviously filming in I'm obviously filming in the new setup, everything I'm obviously filming in a new place, in a new setup. It's not quite as tidy as I would like it yet, but we are getting there. Take care and I'll see you next time.